This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. It's both kind and rational To like knowing animals I can't deny it's fashionable To like knowing animals Hello everyone and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Melbourne and I do like Knowing Animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by the Animal Public's book series from Sydney University Press. Now this is a very affordable collection of books about animal studies. In fact some of the books are even open access which means that you can access them for free from anywhere in the world. And this covers the whole disciplinary range of animal studies. So whether you are from a philosophy background, from a literature background, from a geography background or anything else, there's a good chance that there'll be a book or multiple books in this series of interest to you. Also, a quick shout out to Elizabeth Usher, who provided the updated theme tune for Knowing Animals. To learn more about Elizabeth, visit veganthused.com. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Andrew Lopez. Andrew is a PhD candidate in philosophy at Queen's University in Canada, where he works on critical animal studies, political philosophy, feminist philosophy and the philosophy of biology. Regular listeners to Knowing Animals will have heard his name before. He was the co-author of the excellent Gendering Animals, which I spoke to Letitia Menel about a few months ago. Today, however, I'm going to talk to Andrew about his paper Non-Human Animals and Epistemic Injustice. This was published open access, meaning it's free to read and download, in the Journal of Ethics and Social Philosophy in 2023. Welcome to the podcast, Andrew. Hi, thanks for having me, Josh. Can you start by telling us what led you to work on this topic? In my master's, I did a lot of work. I studied with uh, Letitia Menno and Andrew Fenton at Dalhousie, and I did a lot of work on animal minds while there. And when I transitioned to Queens to start doing my PhD, to work with Will Kimlicka, Will is very interested in the, what's called the political term in animal studies, having to do with how do we sort of incorporate animals into our political communities. And there's a lot of exciting work going on in that field where people are trying to figure out how to incorporate animals as moral, social, and political agents. It's a question that arose for me at the time while starting to look more into this field is, do we need to know what animals know? Like, do we need to figure out how to incorporate them into our epistemic communities? And this very quickly, of course, besides the sort of training I've had in the philosophy of animal minds, very quickly brought me into conversation with work on epistemic injustice. Essentially, epistemic justice is concerned with the idea of how someone can be wronged in their capacity as a knower. There's instances in which, you know, somebody can be wronged by somebody by, let's say, I don't know, being hit on the head or something like that, right? But the idea of being hurt in, their, in your capacity as a knower is, could be exemplified in cases in something like this where somebody is trying to find information about a particular topic, but then they sort of, because of, let's say, what race they perceive you to be, they sort of give you less credibility as an informant due to a particular set of pernicious stereotype that they have against you know, your ethnic group or your racial group. So in this case, that counts as a kind of epistemic injustice. And so I was wondering, well, can non-human animals be subject to this kind of injustice? And is it a kind of barrier for including them in our political uh, ethical communities? Now, as I understand, the example you just gave is an example of testimonial injustice, which is a kind of epistemic injustice. There's also hermeneutic injustice. Could you introduce us to hermeneutic injustice? Sure, of course. Yeah. A hermeneutical injustice is essentially the idea that because of, let's say, unequal participation in the development of concepts or resources together, a person might sort of lack the appropriate resources understood broadly. It could be concepts, could be practices to understand what is happening to them or to communicate something about themselves or about something that is happening to them. So the now, a classic example from Miranda Fricker's Epistemic Injustice that people often refer to is the, the concept of sexual harassment, where at some point this was not a concept. As a result of this not being sort of a concept that was around, and very early on when it just was developed, not everyone understood it, 
it was difficult to communicate exactly what's going on with certain interactions in the workplace. As a result, women are being, you know, what we now understand to be sexually harassed, but they can't sort of properly communicate that to the harasser, to their boss, to anyone else, to, let's say, the unemployment office or anything like that. And it results in various kinds of sort of epistemic and practical harms, right? Because at least in the case of sexual harassment and the example that Fricker uses, the person eventually just can't deal with it, can't stand the harassment, quits, but can't communicate what happened to other people, including can't communicate it to the unemployment office to get sort of assistance, right? And so she suffers both epistemic harms and not being able to communicate with others and practical harms and that she can't get help for what's going on. Now, my understanding is that epistemic injustice is about failing to recognise that others are knowers. But surely animals don't care whether or not we recognise that they're knowers. Yes, I think this is exactly correct. And this is one of the things that I initially started to think, thinking about the paper. Whereas it seems, you know, both the, like the average person, I think, and some philosophers, but surprisingly not that many. <laughs> but many people think it sort of that animals do know things. There's sometimes very trivial examples where we find out that our dog knows how to open the cabinets, right? And that is frustrated. We don't want them to do that, right? What, what sort of stuck out to me about those kinds of examples in, in common speech or whatever is that it points out that they know how to do something. And I started thinking, well, wait, is that, that's a different kind of knowledge. At the time, I wasn't sort of too steep in the, in the literature and epistemology. But I started thinking, well, that's definitely a kind of different kind of knowledge because it has, relates to things like skill, right, or some sort of practical action in the world. Whereas a lot of sort of forms of knowledge that philosophers seem to be concerned with is often a kind of what's called propositional knowledge or a form of like know that. And I thought, well, okay, it seems that you can, of course, you know, experience epistemic injustice when you're sort of trying to put forth propositional knowledge to somebody. But can you experience it in terms of your know-how? Can somebody sort of fail to recognize that you know how to do something? And it, and it seemed, well, okay, maybe we can fail to recognize that animals can fail to know how to do something. And I started thinking, well, okay, but do you need to be recognized? It seems that you don't necessarily have to be invested in being recognized as a knower. But just as in sort of how people can, I know this is a kind of controversial view sometimes for some philosophers, but there is some also intuitive appeal to the idea that you can be wrong without knowing. Common example is sort of, you know, instances of which, let's say, I think Thomas Nagel talks about an example of a man who is sort of being systematically deceived by everyone who claims to love him or be his friend. And intuitively, it seems that he is being wrong, even if he's not, in a sense, being harmed because he's not aware of it. And that seems to be able to apply to cases in which maybe you don't care to, but nevertheless, not being recognized as a knower might lead to certain kinds of practical and epistemic harms for you. For instance, if you're just simply not recognized as a knower, the sort of, let's say, people who can have power over your life may not be interested in providing certain kinds of opportunities that lead to you acquiring certain kinds of epistemic resources or, or skills. And that both obviously diminishes your capacities as a knower and also has negative effects on your life because all of a sudden you don't know how to do certain things. I see. And that could presumably apply to, say, my dogs. If I fail to recognise that my dogs have the capacity to learn how to behave in certain ways that would make their lives better and then fail to offer them the opportunities to learn in those ways, that could be a kind of epistemic injustice against them. Yes. Mm -hmm. But one of the distinctive things about your argument is the role that you ascribe to claims about epistemic communities and the way that animals can be part of epistemic communities. So that's not like the dog example I just gave. When talking about epistemic communities here, and in particular, sort of, I am drawing from work in feminist philosophy, and in particular, it's called feminist epistemology. Feminists have done a lot of important work in both philosophy of science and epistemology to talk about like, well, what is the sort of the makeup of the community that is engaged in various kinds of sort of collaborative research, right? Some of the many things that these feminist philosophers have done is point out how, you know, the presence of different viewpoints helps to put forth more sort of, you know, more novel hypotheses. Feminist philosophers have, have, have done this kind of interesting work in, in philosophy of science, but also in, in, in social epistemology. So one of the things that social epistemologists note is that often, you know, 
even though we might have sort of um, the image of Descartes thinking to himself about various kinds of things, trying to find, you know, a foundation for all of his beliefs. One of the things that social epistemologists, feminist epistemologists agree on is that actually like knowing is often a social thing for a variety of reasons, because we rely on testimony from other people. We trust people to sort of give us accurate information about what has gone on. Sometimes, you know, certain kinds of epistemic work is uh, too burdensome for one person to do alone and we delegate tasks. And we often sort of become, so Annette Beyer, who's a feminist philosopher, talks about how persons are also, are actually a, a kind of uh, second person. But what she means by this is that nobody is, you know, appears in the world fully a person, right? You become a person by being cared for, nurtured, taught, etc., by other persons, right? Similarly, Lorraine Coe draws from this and says, well, this is also what's going on for knowers, for epistemic agents. You don't just appear a knower out of nowhere, right? You are taught certain kinds of standards, taught like who you should listen to, who you should not, etc., right? So we become knowers through other people, essentially our community, right? And this is in particular where feminist philosophers are very interested in because what feminist philosophers will raise as a question is, well, what is known and what doesn't get known? Are there certain kinds of processes that sort of inhibit certain kinds of knowing or try and actually bury certain kinds of knowledge or certain kinds of testimony and things like that? And are there any processes that sort of emphasize or perpetuate various kinds of ignorance, right? So feminist philosophers are particularly interested in this sort of the, the politics of the functioning of this of this epistemic economy or this information economy within communities and so drawing from that i specifically i focus in the on in the paper on animals that are typically considered to be social animals who do in fact rely on conspecifics members of their of their species uh, of their group to do various things including acquire skills for everyday coping some animals are not born with the skills that they possess as adults they have to learn them they also they rely on conspecifics for information about their environment in general and they also rely on in cases of uh, of disagreement between in the community they often rely on the, let's say the partial perspectives that individuals have for collaborative decision making the most common example that i refer to in the paper is sometimes herds don't know which direction to go and they actually come together and there's interesting dynamics about how they decide about where to go. Um, and all of these things, all of these uh, beliefs, skills, and information are all subject to various kinds of ways in which you can mess with the sort of uh, transmission of these two, two conspecifics. And that's sort of where, I, where the argument talks about the, dis the distribution of epistemic resources and how messing with this can be a form of wrong that qualifies as epistemic injustice. What kind of messing with are you imagining? So one example that I talk about is on the role of matriarchs in elephant herds. I don't know if herds are the right word, but in, ele in elephant groups, right? Where matriarchs tend to be, you know, the older, more experienced members of the group. And it turns out that they end up having a sort of significant influence in the group when it comes to addressing certain kinds of challenges in elephant worlds. For instance, like maneuvering through drought in, in, the, you know, in the summer or something, or addressing predators, right? One of the things that we know that, you know, elephants are obviously very susceptible to because of their features is poaching. One thing that sort of ethologists who study elephants have found is that groups who have had their matriarchs removed, quote unquote, due to poaching or, or other forms of, you know, let's say hunting, killing in general, fair worse in those metrics when it comes to sort of dealing with these sort of challenges that are posed to them in their environments. So uh, matriarchs tend to have knowledge about where to go and when to go during droughts, so they're more likely to find water. They're also sort of more knowledgeable about how to deal with, uh, let's say, male and female lions, because the size and strength of male and female lions differ. You actually do need different strategies to address, address these. And other members in the group have learned from that older matriarch how to do these things. But if all of a sudden you remove her, problems start to cascade for the group, right? And, and, most, and most often is the case that younger elephants, especially calves, die 
either due to predation or due to things like dehydration and starvation. So correct me if I'm wrong, is the idea that in addition to any wrongs associated with the killing and the suffering involved in the hunting, there's also an epistemic wrong because this hunting is removing the knowledge from that family group? Yes, that's exactly, yeah, my claim, yeah. That's very interesting. The talk of elephants invites a natural next question, which is elephants are quite, as you say, emotionally, intellectually, socially sophisticated animals. Mm -hmm. Do you think any animal could be subject to epistemic injustice or are they going to need to be relatively sophisticated animals? Mm, Yeah, this is something that I'm partly trying to deal with uh, in my dissertation. (laughs) So in the paper, I specifically focused on like animals that are considered like intensely social and who for who there are there's a lot of research concerning um, their practices such that there are plenty of ethologists talking about them as actually possessing culture right but one thing that i have been asked is like well what about like you know an octopus right because that's often considered you know an extremely intelligent animal um, and yet is not a social animal right and based on certain definitions of culture, definitely does not have culture. And I haven't quite fully decided on this question, but I have developed an argument in my dissertation that does rely on more work in cognitive science, in particular sort of some of the 4E cognition uh, research, in particular using work in extended cognition to talk about animals. So this kind of literature has been used a lot to talk about human beings, there's a minority of researchers out there who are talking about this in the context of animals as well. And the part of the, um, the argument that I've developed is that through some resources and extended cognition, we might be able to plausibly talk about animals that are not highly social animals, or maybe not sort of, let's say, cognitively sophisticated in the, in the head, that may nevertheless sort of be able to be subject to epistemic injustice, given that we can sort of mess with their larger cognitive environment. Now, the big hurdle to cross here, which is also actually um, a kind of a friendly criticism that somebody brought up for the, the published paper, is that I think just traditional epistemologists are not fans of this. <laughs> and the main reason is because they're saying, well, you're talking a lot about cognition. And sure, that's related to knowing, but it's not knowing. There's a difference here. And someone said, you know, maybe what you should, you know, what you could talk about is something like, a new thing like cognitive injustice. Maybe that's what's going on. And the same kind of problem would apply to the extended cognition argument that, I'm, that I've developed. I've developed something that hopefully works to maybe at least try to address that. <laughs> that's very interesting because that does speak to, in a way, the next question I was going to ask, which is I was wondering, given that animals and epistemic injustice are two literatures in philosophy that haven't really met in a big way, there's a couple of examples which you cite where they they have met a little bit. Do you have a sense of what people working on epistemic injustice think about what you're doing here? Do you have a sense of what they might say in response? I think, yeah, most of them just are not concerned with it, uh, (laughs) given that most people in our discipline just don't care about animals in many ways. The most support that I found from people, as you might expect, it was from people who do work in animal minds. It was similar for the Gendering Animals paper. (laughs) And from feminists who have, to some some extent, concerns about non-human animals. As far as people in the actual epistemic injustice literature, uh, I've talked with people who do research in this and they hadn't thought of it. But in general, uh, I think they probably don't go for it very much for the typical kinds of sort of biases that we have in the discipline. However, if I was going to be more, you know, a bit more, let's say, charitable in in the in the construction of what maybe why they don't see or, or engage with the with with the question, it probably has to do with maybe some of the background commitments of the epistemic justice literature in the first place. So a lot of what is done in or what is written in the epistemic injustice literature implicitly or explicitly seems to be informed by more internalist accounts of justification in epistemology. So there are various kinds, but essentially internalism is is the view that like essentially one's belief qualifies as knowledge if the person who has the belief either has access to the reasons that make their belief true 
or can or can be sort of held uh, to be responsible for the belief to be held epistemically responsible right and uh, in, in literature and internalism for the most part just says well very young children and animals don't can't do that so they they can't be knowers they can't know right whereas externalist accounts of justification which is just essentially the view that like there's something outside of the uh, subject's awareness that plays a role in sort of justifying their belief into knowledge. Externalists are to, pretty friendly to the idea that young children and animals know, but externalists are also also seen and sometimes describe themselves as we're just describing how knowledge happens. This isn't a normative thing, right? And so that itself doesn't get taken up a whole lot because it's missing the normative aspect, which epistemic injustice is totally concerned with, right? Nevertheless, there is a way possibly in which you can move forward that there do seem to be some versions of a kind of externalism that can be normative in some way. And we might be able to borrow, here I'm definitely borrowing from Mia Cernavasan's paper on radical externalism at the very end. She talks about, actually, maybe we can have some sort of normative externalism. And she points a bit, I think, to both Marx and Aristotle to talk about, yeah, look, here's some work in which it's normative, but not in the traditional, like, what is the person doing kind of way, right? And I'm actually partly constructing a parallel argument in my dissertation to try and address this kind of question. To summarize, don't care a whole lot about animals in, in the first place, and to have certain kinds of commitments that I think kind of block seeing that possibility in the first place as well. That's really fascinating. We've covered quite a lot of technical ground here, which I love. But I think a lot of listeners might be thinking, what should I take away from this? So what do you think is the practical upshot of recognising that animals might be victims of epistemic injustice? I think the most practical upshot here would be that even if even if you may not care that animals are ours, let's say you recognise that they are, but you don't care, right? Plenty of people are, or at least, you know, say they are concerned with animal welfare or well-being, right? Now, there is a way in which we can address those two without caring if an animal knows things, right? We might say like, okay, well, maybe they need to know certain things for their well-being, but our primary concerns with their well-being will care about what they know only insofar as it contributes to their well-being, right? And it turns out that given that the focus on, on know-how and skills and information for making decisions, that it actually does have a profound impact on their well-being. And so it can lead to practical, a lot of practical harms if they don't have access to these uh, opportunities to develop these skills or to get this information. And so even if you don't care about them being as a knower, if you care about their well-being, you'll, know, you'll still think that, okay, maybe I do need to pay attention to this question about what animals are actually cognitively and epistemically doing in order to sort of meet their uh, welfare or well-being needs. Now, Andrew, we ask every guest on Knowing Animals five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I think so, yeah. <laughs> Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Yeah, I read in, pretty sure it was an excerpt, or it might have been the full paper, I'm not sure. In first or second year at Fullerton College, I think an excerpt from Peter Singer's Animal Liberation. Uh, that is definitely the first thing I read. Though I sort of had the experience, I think many undergraduates do, that it wasn't actually all that impactful. Many undergrads will read the piece and be like, oh, yeah, he's totally right. And then you just move on, right? Nothing changes about your life. I think there was something very similar for me when I read that piece. But it is the first piece that I read, yeah. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? I actually cannot. Um, I'm sure that I wrote something in undergrad, but... Since I cannot recall, I will say maybe the paper I wrote in my animal studies seminar in my master's, which was on, weirdly enough, uh, Wilfred Sellers and non-human animals. <laughs> if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? I would really like to name four here, but just given temporal priority, uh, I'm going to say uh, Matthew Calarco. Matthew Calarco uh, is at Cal State Fullerton, which is where I did my third and fourth year of undergrad. And he is the one who got me entirely on onto the question of animals. Before I had taken his courses, I was a Kantian <laughs> and didn't care about animals at all. And he just completely 
you know, turn me 180. All faults can be laid down at his door. <laughs> what do you think is the most important thing that academics can do for animals? I think in their capacity as academics, what they could, one of the most important things that they could do is, I think, teaching about them at length. Often, if they are taught at all, it's like, okay, well, we're going to do one unit, one lecture on animals just as a kind of tacked on thing near the end or something, right? I think teaching about them at length, make, maybe like making a, a substantial unit of the course or something, would be very important and have a profound effect on students. So while I know the, you know, the example is in animal studies course, when I took this course in my, in my master's, we had four weeks just on animal cognition. We weren't doing ethics, you know, or, or political turn stuff. We were just doing cognition, right? And there were people who signed up for the course. who's like, well, I just need credits. It's not an interesting. I don't really care about animals. Those four weeks increasingly just started to have an effect on them. They're like, oh, that's what's going on in the animal mind. You know, all right, this is starting to, you know, even though we haven't gone to that material, it's starting to make me think about the kinds of things that we do to them, <laughs> you know, it started to make me think about, you know, why I eat animals and whether I should be eating them. And this is just talking about cognition, right? But it's just like, yeah, just learning about animals uh, at length, treating them as a serious topic in their own right, not just as something that's tacked on and not just as something to teach us ultimately more about ourselves. If you had the power to change one thing about the human non-human animal relationship, what would it be? I would probably say changing the destruction of their environments, given that how reliant not just human beings are, but animals are on their environments, not for just the acquisition of things like nutrition or shelter, but the way in which like the knowledge that they develop and cultures that they develop uh, together have to do directly with the land that they inhabit. And messing with that messes not just with their well-being, but even sort of the cultural richness and cognitive richness of their lives. What are you working on next? I finalize a, a draft of my dissertation, and the next step is to try and convert chapters three and four into their own papers on animals. One of them addressing the question that I raised earlier about extended cognition in animals um, and how this relates to epistemology. And the fourth chapter, a different paper on bringing that framework into ethics. Sort of uh, the first being a sort of expanded sense of what it means to be a knower, both spatially and also beyond the human. And then the, se the second paper on being like, okay, well, what is that? What is this expanded form of an epistemic agent look like? And how does it, or how does it interact with ethics? And how can people find out more about your work? Best place is probably my website, lopezphilosophy.com. I'll also sometimes randomly tweet about things. Feel free to follow me, respond to me or something at an Andrewlis, A-N-D-R-U-L-U-S, on Twitter, or X, as it's now called. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be by the time this goes out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Andrew, for joining us for this podcast. Thanks for having me, Josh. It's good to see you. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on X at knowing underscore animals and we're on facebook at knowing animals you can follow me on twitter or x at josh l milburn and i'm on instagram at a vegan philosopher please do spread the word about knowing animals spread the word about these scholars and papers that we're profiling and if you're teaching this year please do include knowing animals on your reading lists or your virtual learning environments for students to tune in i'm josh milburn and i do like knowing animals for more great iRule podcasts, visit iRulePod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!